Okay, we're back, everybody. Our first speaker today is Nick Braulio. Uh, Nick Braulio is a network and security engineer with 16 years of experience ranging from enterprise data center architecture and complex high-performance computing environments to commercial and scientific service provider networks. Nick has been supporting Bro IDS off and on since 2003. He currently works as an engineer, uh, sorry, as a network engineer for Energy Sciences Networks, uh, or ESNet for short. Welcome, Nick. I don't think anyone's ever clapped for me before. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, securing an open perimeter network, um, specifically regarding Science DMZ, but it's really applicable to any network that can't have a security appliance in line. Um, and I will probably interchange the term open perimeter network and Science DMZ a bunch of times without really realizing I'm doing it. So just keep that in mind. Um, so uh, motivations for, the, for, for this type of network uh, vary, um, and, and the need to secure it obviously is, is there regardless of what the motivations are. Uh, so, you know, you've got a science DMZ, you need a science DMZ, or you have a need for an open perimeter network without some sort of impeding device in it uh, f to support large flows, you know, greater than 10 gig or, or whatever, um, and you need to provide uh, confidentiality and, you know, all of the accountability and integrity of data, things that uh, that entails. So, a very basic science DMZ, or very basic uh, enterprise slash uh, campus network, you know, you got your border routers, your firewalls, security appliances, IDSs, and then out there be dragons, right? So that's, that's the typical architecture that exists in many, many places. When you add a science DMZ into that, you see, you know, you've got this fast path, right? So straight through, goes around everything, and it allows for access within the GUI center of your network it, you know, in theory, without any of these devices in there that can that can cause problems with science data or any other types of you know large flow data that that uh, will need to traverse that. So, seeing that, that's what you know a network architect is going to say. This is you know here's what it is. Now the security guy is going to see this, right? Now there's dragons everywhere, and this is good, right? Because that's his job. Right? And, and as someone who's been a security guy off and on, I would probably say, okay, this is what's going to happen unless you've got a mechanism for doing something about it. Um, so, practically speaking, um, this would be uh, the, the real architecture for that um, from a 5,000 foot view, right? So, note the tap that exists right there, right? So, the mechanism of that tap doesn't really matter, right? It can be an optical tap, it can be you know, some sort of tap ag device, it can be um, a span port. It doesn't really make a difference, right? The point is that you have some sort of mechanism for grabbing the data passively that traverses that particular link, and then you send it off to somewhere for analysis. Um, and this is probably the most important aspect of this particular architecture, right? Oh, yeah, there's, a, there's an error that I put in. <laughs> um, so. Let's take a, a quick step back and, and think about how existing security works on your network, right? So how many people out there actually have an open perimeter network? Okay, there's a good chunk of people out there that do, so that, that's great. So it's, uh, it's not something new, really, right? I mean, NCSA has been an open perimeter network since forever, right? There's never really been a firewall at the border. And so, you know, it's, a, it's an architecture that's existed for a while, but in enterprises and, and other locations, it's it's pretty uncommon, right? <clears throat> so rather than reinvent the wheel, let's think about the things that already exist that can be repurposed. You know, so you, know, you want to repurpose any, any aspect of your existing security to make the, the new one not only map in easier for supportability, but also to ease the deployment of it, right? Um, you might be taking the door off the lock, but you're going to scrutinize any packets that come in and out of it at that point. So perimeter access control is going to be your first path forward doing that. Um, you're probably doing this already. Um, if you are a networking person, you'll recognize this as you know, basically hardening your devices, limiting access to the control planes and control, and control protocols of them, 
blocking things like SNMP, um, SSH, NetConf, whatever other uh, services that those particular devices may be running. You're going to firewall those off. That should all happen in hardware, on the physical network hardware. And like I said, you're probably doing this on your border-facing devices already anyway. If you're not, you should probably think about it. <clears throat> routing is, so I'm a network engineer by, by most of my career, right? And so routing is the thing that I go to as the sledgehammer that's going to really limit what you can do and see over a particular networking path. If you've got, for example, a science DMZ and you're connecting to a research provider, um, at, let's just say um, the LHC1 or, or one, of the, one of the Large Hadron Collider private networks overlays that exists, um, just as an example, but it can really be anything. It can be an extranet with another company and it can be, or it can be uh, you know, a private connection to another university. It really doesn't matter, right? You only want to give them the routes for the resources that they need to see. You don't necessarily, say you've got a slash 16 of address space. They don't need to know about all of that on your open perimeter network. If you've got a private peering with them, only give them the routes that they need to see. Give them the slash 24 that your science data exists in, that is your cluster, or give them you know, the slash 27 that is whatever the extranet service that you're sharing with them. Don't give them all of your resources. This is a, this is a sledgehammer and a, and a great way to really limit the exposure of a network, basically making it dark to whoever you're connecting to, because as far as they're concerned from a routing perspective, it doesn't exist. It will take the normal path in through your, uh, uh, through your regular uh, security perimeter. Software patching, we're doing this already, right? Just continue doing it, maybe be a little bit more vigilant about it because you know, these devices, you know, your hosts, your Unix systems, what have you, may exist. You know, they're, they are going to exist without the benefit of a hardware device in their sort of limiting packets to them, so make sure they're up to date. Utilize host-based firewalls. This is, this, is a, this is something that is, I think, often underrated, right? Because I was always taught that you want to firewall as close to the resource as possible. So putting this big device at your border that's going to filter everything coming in is, you know, that's fine and good, but there's a bunch of steps potentially between that border and your actual host device, right? So utilizing host-based firewalls is a great way to ensure, one, that you know exactly what's filtered on your given host from that Ethernet port out. And it also brings that filtering as close to the resource as is possible. Um, there's lots of really good utilities out there for managing these types of rule sets. Google has something called Caprica that can build rule sets and things like that, and you can disseminate them using different mechanisms, um, which really brings us to the central host management piece of this um, that would allow for easier dissemination of these rule sets from a central location. Now, this kind of thing's been around for a while, things like CF Engine, Puppet, um, what have you. Um, it, it, but it's really starting to get a lot more attention now because the cloud-based providers are using it. There's no way they could operate at the scale that they do without it. So utilizing something like this within that environment will help tie everything together. It'll help you push your rule sets out. It'll help you push users out. It'll help you decide you know, that this is the particular binary I want running and ensure that it's actually running on there if you, you know, configure it correctly. Because you don't want a Trojan SSH running if you've got, you know, if you've got this uh, host-based central management stuff, it can say, hey, that, that checksum doesn't match, pull that off, put on the new one, or put on the one that I want on there, right? A lot of this stuff people are probably doing already, but it's sort of tying it all together that makes it, makes it work in this particular environment. Um, host IDS, along with, you know, the host-based firewalls, this is, this is a, a great augmentation to that because it, it provides something that's hard to get any other way. You know, it gives you a mechanism for viewing events that happen on the host from the actual host itself. Um, it can also be one of the things that's really sort of daunting to take on because there's a lot of tuning involved, you know, just like any other IDS. Um, but I think the benefits of adding that far outweigh the cost of configuring it and, and maintaining it. Um, and all of these things sort of tie together in your defense in depth type strategies, right? 
Accountability is a hard one, right? It's, I think about this as one of the more nuanced pieces of, of securing an open perimeter network and in security in general, right? Because it's, it's highly interpretable. Um, there are lots of ways to think about it and lots of ways to do it. Central user management is the first thing I think about when I think about accountability, right? I don't want like Telnet on my devices, thinking from a network engineering perspective, right? I don't want Telnet on my devices and everyone logging in with the same user account because you know, then I have no accountability on who's doing what. Same goes for systems, right? You want to be able to control who has user accounts on any given resource, and you want to make sure that that's consistent across any given environment. Um, the host-based, uh, the, the central management stuff actually will aid with this as well. Um, in addition to that, it's a good idea, in my opinion, for especially for scientific resources, to uh, set up things like jump hosts or you know, bastion host type environments where you can't get into uh, resource X without jumping through host Z. Gives it a funnel point, right? And then you can collect the logs from that and build your baselines, right? This is my favorite part of the whole thing. I love data. I want as much data as possible and I wanna see awesome analytics on it, right? I wanna see graphs, I wanna see everything possible I don't want to think about storing it. That's for the storage guys, right? Because that's no fun. But you know, I want to see graphs for everything. I want to see flow data. I want to see statistics for traffic throughput. I want to say see CPU resources. I want to see syslogs. I want to see everything I possibly can. It doesn't necessarily all have to be in the same place. Of course, that helps, right? But I just want to have it. Because what that gives me is that gives me the ability to detect anomalies first and foremost, right? It also gives me a historical view of what happened when and who did what. And I can reference that at any point given my retention policy, which, you know, may vary based on the type of environment you're in. Um, centralized logging, you're probably already doing this. Your networking guys are probably doing it. Your systems guys are probably doing it. Security guys are probably doing it. There may be three of them. It, you know, there may be one, right? It doesn't really matter as long as you have the data and you can get to it. Uh, there are lots of commercial options for this, uh, lots of open source options for this. There's no reason this shouldn't be happening all the time, right? Every resource should be logging everything it can within reason. And you know, the, good reason, the good reasons for that are obvious, right? You want to be able to reference this data, and you want to do analytics on it, and you want to do baselines, right? And all this stuff t kind of ties together. <clears throat> this one's sort of hard in an open perimeter environment. You know, providing the confidentiality of the data is difficult because you don't necessarily want to use encryption across the wire, especially if high performance is a you know, a key thing that you're looking for because encryption not only adds overhead, but people tend to use SCP for things, which doesn't necessarily lend itself well to large fat transfers over very large areas, you know, long fat networks. Um, it's got its own win windowing mechanisms and it adds the encryption overhead. So you really have to think about how to do the confidentiality of your data that's traversing this. Now, one of the things that's important to note is that you should be using encrypted protocols for management of all of these systems, right? You need to use SSH, you need to use SSL, you don't want to be telnetting around and doing all of these things because um, that's just not a good idea and it's not 1989 anymore. So, um, you know, encryption protocols for, uh, for management. There's some other things that you can do for uh, data that's transiting the path for instance, like checking MD5s on you know, the beginning of the transfer and the end of the transfer will allow you to uh, see things like silent CRC corruptions that may happen across the wire, or you know, it can also ensure that the data hasn't been tampered with in one way or another. Um, so th uh, th and there's tools out there, obviously, you guys probably know what those are that can do that on, on scientific scales. Um, and they're, they're good for non-science data as well. You know, they work for basically any data that's transiting a wire. Um, all right, now this is probably what you want to hear about. Um, the, real, the real work of securing the open perimeter networks or your science DMZ or what have you is going to be done by the IDS, right? The reason you guys are all here to, to hear about Bro IDS. Now, there's lots of different options. Depending on your environment, you know, that's a call that you make based on what your needs uh, are. Um, in science environments, in R&E environments, Bro IDS has been battle tested in some of the most abusive 
networks out there. Cynet is a really good example. The network that controls the supercomputing conference every year has used Bro for as long as I've been around. Um, and you know, it, it's very flexible and it can do all of the things that is generally needed regardless of what you want. Um, obviously, your IDS needs to be tuned for your environment, right? It's just like any IPS. You know, your, your, your management team may say, well, the IDS is a set and forget kind of thing, but everybody here that's ever touched one knows that that is absolutely not the case. The only difference between that and this is that the ID, IPS sits in line and gets in the way. The IDS sits passively, so it's easier to ignore if you don't tune it right. Um, so think about the tuning of that. But that's gonna do most of the heavy lifting of your, of your open perimeter network. It's gonna provide the visibility that you're gonna want because you don't have a filtering device in there or an IPS device in there. External scanning services, this one's often forgotten. And honestly, I've forgotten this one. Uh, you know, you, you, how many people are doing internal scanning right now of resources? Awesome, fantastic. How many people do external scanning too? Excellent, I'm talking to the right crowd then. Um, so, as the number of hands show, you guys understand that scanning from outside is gonna give you way better information than scanning from inside, right? Scanning from inside is great, and you need to do it, and it's really important if you allow bring your own device type of uh, environments, but scanning from outside is gonna show you what the people from outside are gonna see, you know, what the bad guys are gonna poke at, and um, we'll do some questions at the end. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> there's lots of options out there, there's commercial and, and uh, open source, and uh, you know, they're, uh, they're generally fairly inexpensive for the open source, and you know, your mileage may vary for the commercial stuff. Um, the actions are the, I don't wanna call them the hard part, they're the interesting part to me, because as a network en engineer, this is the brass tack, right? I wanna know, if somebody's poking at my network, what am I gonna do about it, right? Player X, bad actor, is hammering on something, right? I want them to go away, and I want them to go away right now. So in theory, and in my opinion, actually not theory, I know it works. The, be <laughs> the best way to do that is BGP black hole routing, right? It's been around forever. It utilizes a very well-documented, well-supported protocol. It can be scripted and it um, is widely deployed. It's been deployed in service providers forever, right? And, and it can be triggered by any number of things. It's basically anything you wanna write can trigger it. Um, <clears throat> so, I skipped ahead a slide. So there's the black hole routing. <laughs> Here's the mechanics of the black hole routing, right? So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're unfamiliar with how this works, Basically, um, the, the remote triggered black hole events are gonna happen like this. Nefarious traffic appears, um, the anomaly is detected by the IDS, and the IDS uh, triggers a black hole router. Um, it triggers the black hole router to say, hey, I don't like this slash 30 or whatever, or slash 32, whatever the address is, slash 128 if you're doing V6. Sends a BGP update to the border device, border device blocks it, and it goes away, essentially. Um, it's very simple, it works pretty quickly. It's not gonna be as fast as an IPS, right, because it's gonna operate on, I see it, I send an update, update happens, right? And so, you know, it, it, but it's still very, very quick. It's essentially, it's the speed of a route insertion and withdrawal, um, which most people don't ever see. If you're not a network engineer, you're never gonna see those. Right? You don't know they happen, they just happen. Um, but they're pretty quick. And this, this has been the mechanism for doing firewalling in this type of environment for as long as I've been doing this kind of thing. Uh, it, it works really well. Um, another newer option, which I'm pretty excited about, is called BGP Flow Spec. And what this is, is um, it's an extension to the existing BGP protocol that allows for the dissemination of more complex rules so essentially what it, what it allows you to do is it allows you to disseminate or send out the uh, updates like firewall rule type syntaxes where I can say this address, this port, this protocol in a BGP update. So it can happen at the scale of 
or at the speed of black hole routing, but it gives you a far more granular way of doing it. With that more complicated update comes a little bit of baggage though, so it's something to be aware of where I think this is probably a really good mechanism going forward as, a, you know, as part of the defense in depth strategy of securing really any network, right? Cloud providers are using this already. The, the problems lie, or the, I guess the, the, the things you have to think about with this are that it's more complicated, right? So it's gonna consume with far more resources. So you have to be really careful in how many updates you push to it because it can quickly overrun hardware. Um, so that's why I would recommend this not being the primary strategy, but this be you know, just a piece of it. Uh, in addition to that, it's fairly new. I think the RFC's been around for maybe five years, maybe six, something like that. And so it's not widely deployed in network hardware. Like all the big players have it in their big devices, but you're not gonna find it in like a Cisco 7200 or something like that, right? You're gonna need to get a bigger uh, like a carrier grade or border grade device to get this feature right now. I think it'll eventually, as you know, CPUs go up and merchant silicon kind of takes over and does more things, that this will really get adopted more widely. Um, and I think it's a, a really great security strategy going forward as a, as a tool in the toolbox. Now, speaking of those kind of things, you guys are all doing IPv6, right? And I got one guy. I have two guys, okay, I'll have a couple more. Great, great. Everybody should be doing it. This is sort of the thing of mine, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soapbox here for a minute, so bear with me. Um, anything that you do on v4 as far as security policy goes, for those who are running it and for those that are thinking about it, which should be everybody, you have to think about it for v6 too, because I don't think there's, I don't think there's anybody out there that's going to run a v6-only network for a while, for, for the foreseeable future, unfortunately because v4 is so prolific and it's everywhere and everything supports it, and we already have it, frankly. But v6 dual stack networks need to be thought of as two separate autonomous protocols, right? Because they are, they're ships in the night. And for anything you do for v4, you need to think about v6 for as well. And if you're dual stacking, great. You've, you're probably already thinking about these things. But if you're not dual stacking, you still need to think about this because lots and lots of devices and operating systems, if they don't see v6, they're gonna tunnel it. They're gonna automatically tunnel it. And unless you control every aspect of your network, including the host systems, which some enterprises do, you're gonna run into this. I guarantee you, you will see, if you look at flow data and you, and you don't control every aspect of your systems and your network, that you will see tunneled v4, v6 traffic, guaranteed. Um, so, Blocking that is one mechanism, but that's just gonna cause problems later because it's gonna make the network look slow when things, because things will always try v6 first and then they will fail over to v4. So getting a handle on it early and knowing how to deal with it, especially in an environment where you don't have a firewall, is very important. So don't forget about v6. And I can talk ad nauseum about this if you guys wanna find me later, because v6 is kind of my thing. Same goes for SDN, right? This is the buzzword. This is, this is the cloud computing of now, like everything is SDN instead of cloud, and sometimes they overlap. However, it is changing the way networking is done. And with that, the security bits also have to change. But the, the great thing about SDN is that there's lots of really neat stuff you can do with SDN in the security realm. Right, the, the use of things like the OpenFlow protocol, which often SDN and OpenFlow are used synonymously, but they're, they're not really the same thing. I mean, they, they kind of are, but they're not, they're not exactly the same. But using things like OpenFlow, you can use a far greater match, uh, far greater match criteria to do things on your network. So say uh, you've got an OpenFlow switch that you wanna block one particular MAC address on, or you wanna take traffic from this one particular host and send it somewhere else for, to analyze it. Now in the past, you had to do things like policy routing and really kind of gross stuff on the network to make that happen. And SDN sort of makes that a little more elegant, right? It's still new, but I think that it's a good thing to keep in your back pocket as, as a mechanism going forward for doing things that you may have always wanted to do that you couldn't do before. It also allows for the purchase of much less expensive merchant silicon-based hardware in some cases. So you can buy 
you know, 40 gig ports for a fraction of what they would cost on you know, one particular platform. You can buy them on another one because it's all based on merchant silicon. Um, and there's a lot of people doing this stuff already. Right? So if you do some Googling, you'll probably get overwhelmed by the amount of responses that you see from you know, SDN security and merchant silicon stuff. But the real trick, the real key to making all this work and securing an, an open perimeter slash science DMZ network isn't any of these things. These are just pieces that have to happen to get the mechanics down, right? The real key to doing all this is that you gotta work, all the teams need to work together, right? And, and we're gonna have a kumbaya moment here for a second. So you've got your systems guys, you've got your network guys, and you've got your security guys. They may not ever talk to each other, or they may avoid each other, or they may be the same person. It doesn't really make a difference, but they all need to concentrate on the things that are their core competency to make something like this happen and happen correctly because you're basically taking your GUI center, it's an exposed nerve, right? You've got an exposed nerve out there. You have to make sure that it's secure, right? You need it. You need it out there because you need to move the data, but you also need to make sure that it doesn't become a bit cannon. So, you know, or a malware producer or whatever. Um, so working together with other teams, I can tell you with certainty that this works because I did it. I've done it, and some of the people that we that work together are actually in this room, and it, and it works, right? So that that's the real trick, right? So okay, kumbaya moment over. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of useful tools uh, for getting uh, in contact with ESNet for this kind of thing. Uh, the engagement group, their whole job is to talk to um, scientists and engage with them and find out their needs and stuff. So if you're a DOE site or whatever, that you know that's a that's a good resource. Um, the Science CNC Security Link has some of the same stuff on it. Um, a little more, you know, more links and things like that. Some stuff that I throw that I have done are linked to on there as well. Um, if you're interested in that, and I put together sort of a baseline checklist. I think you're going to distribute the slides at all. Okay, so you can have this. This is by no means complete, right? But it's a good starting point, right? It's a foundation to work from. You know, obviously you need to apply your environments template to anything that has been discussed here, you know, pick and choose the things that are appropriate, but, you know, there's a, there's a thing to start with. I assume I'm going to get some questions. You were kind of surprised at the number of people that do outside vulnerability scans. If, you, if you're not a government guy, PCI requires that you do some of that? Yeah. I've, I've avoided PCI. <laughs> So that's probably why I didn't know that. That's actually good to know because I think that's a really important piece to take into account and a lot of people don't think about it in my experience. And if you're really running bro, you know when the outside vendor does it? Yes. Actually, that's something that's a very good point to bring up, right? If you're running remote triggered black hole routing and you're, and you're doing outside scanning, make sure to whitelist your, outside, your particular outside scanner or you will get immediately blocked. And I can tell you from experience that that happens. So, you know, you may, you may want to block your, you know, your, your uh, external resource that's scanning, just that may be part of the process, that, you know, that they want to see, but that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, so the, uh, the, the statement, since the, he's not talking to the mic, was that they failed their PCI uh, because audit they because they blocked it. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of avoided PCI if, if possible, so I'm... I'm blissfully ignorant of some of those uh, nuances. But that's a, that's a good, very good point, thank you. Anyone else, questions, comments? Rotten fruit to throw at me. Great, thanks. And like I said, you can grab me if you wanna talk about this stuff offline, feel free to approach me. I love to hear my own voice, so. <laughs>